Hi, this is Rich Troxler, a.k.a. Rich Trox. This is the first of my View from the Beach series of videos on learning to read a beach for the purpose of identifying the most likely spots to catch fish from. If you wish to catch fish on a more consistent basis, then being able to understand what the water and beach are telling you is of paramount importance when it comes to deciding when and where to fish. I'm always amazed at how many times I see people walk to the water's edge, spike a rod, and then sit and wait. This is the worst thing you can do. Fish, particularly predatory fish, don't do random, and they certainly don't just swim around looking for something to commit suicide on. This is the basis for the old adage that 90% of the fish are located in 10% of the water, and that 10% of the fishermen catch 90% of the fish. So let's take a look at what you need to know in order to up your game and join that select 10% who catch the most fish. Probably the most important skill you will need to develop is the ability to read waves. When standing on Virgin's shoreline, wave action and water movement are the primary means you have of determining what is going on beneath the water's surface. And what the bottom is doing is important, because this is one of the major things that fish relate to. While the math of fluid dynamics is fairly dense, you don't need to know any of it in order to read water. But before you can understand exactly what a wave is telling you, it's vital to know just what a wave is and how it behaves. There is a lot of stuff about waves already on the internet, so I'll try to keep it brief. Most waves get their start as wind energy. The wind passing over the top of the water transfers some of its energy to the water. This energy is stored in the form of a wave. The more wind, the more energy stored. A wave is not water movement or current. It's just energy, which is why in the ocean things bob up and down as the wave goes by. They don't travel with the wave and neither does the water. The energy passes through the water and causes it to go up and down. Once waves get near the shore, then things begin to change. As an ocean wave approaches the shore, the wave's energy begins to interact with the seafloor. This slows the wave down and causes the wave to begin cresting, an effect called shoaling. The period or spacing between the waves does not change, but they gain height as the energy in the waves is compressed into a shorter horizontal distance. When the bottom comes up high enough, the wave can no longer support itself, and it breaks. This is an important point to understand, that wave height and how it breaks are related to water depth and contour of the bottom. How a wave breaks contains important information. There are basically two main types of breakers. The first, called spilling breakers, occur on flatter shores and their crests break and cascade down the front as they draw near the shore, dissipating energy gradually. These are the beaches with slowly rising bottoms, no offshore structures like bars, and flat, nondescript shorelines. I call these dead beaches. Surfers and bathers may love them, but they're typically not very good for fishing. The second type of breaker is the plunging breaker. A plunging breaker occurs on steeper shores, where the crest curls and falls over the front of the advancing wave, and the whole wave then collapses at once. This is the type of beach where rollers come right into shore and then close out, sometimes with an audible thump. Because the wave is not breaking further out, this indicates that the water is deep enough to keep the wave from breaking until it runs out of room and crashes right at the water's edge. Again, wave height and the way it breaks are directly related to water depth and bottom contour. These beaches are usually far more desirable for fishing. While many beaches are uniform in nature, without much obvious structure to affect wave action, many more have mixed structure and bottom contour, and this is where learning to read water will pay dividends. The reason for this is that most fish will stick to changes in bottom contour like glue. It's their world, and they know it well, and changes in bottom contour are like highways to them. Changes in bottom contour cause several things to happen, the most important of which is the effect it has on waves and water movement. These effects typically create favorable feeding conditions for predatory fish, which is why it is so important to be able to identify them. Once you understand how a wave behaves and why, you will then be able to identify hard structure like sandbars, troughs, holes, and submerged points, as well as soft structure such as riptide, sweep, and eddies. All of these, either by themselves or in combination, are important when determining when and where to fish. And even those stretches of shoreline that don't seem to have any obvious structure affecting wave action will usually have one or two minor changes in bottom contour somewhere along them. And if you can find them, it can make all the difference. One more thing that is very important when learning to read water is that tidal movement can radically change what you are looking at. In general, incoming water is the best time to observe wave action when you are attempting to determine bottom contour. 
During the incoming tide, waves, meaning the energy stored in them, and tidal current, which is the physical movement of water, are basically moving in the same direction, so the wave remains more consistent. When the tide is going out, wave action is affected by the tidal current, which is running against them now, causing waves to build higher and break earlier, not unlike a standing wave in an inlet. In effect, the outgoing tidal current is soft structure acting against the wave. So what you want is the wave direction and tidal current running in the same direction, or as close to it as possible. So let's take a quick look at some of the hard and soft structures that can be identified by wave action. I'll be doing videos covering each of these in more detail in the near future, so this is just a quick primer. The most obvious piece of structure that wave action gives away is the common offshore sandbar. These reveal themselves by the waves breaking on them with smaller waves making their way to shore. This happens because as the wave approaches the bar, the bottom rises, which in turn causes the wave to rise in height until it can no longer support itself and breaks. The remaining energy washes over the bar and reforms as smaller waves with no cresting. The reason they don't crest is because there is typically a trough or deeper area between the sandbar and the beach, and the remaining energy in the wave is not strong enough to interact with the deeper bottom. The smaller waves usually break right near shore unless there is another bar or flat bottom between the bar and the shore. I mentioned the word trough a couple sentences ago, and a trough is another type of structure that can be identified by wave action. If you have an offshore bar that is causing the waves to break on it, and then the waves continue to push white water in front of them, as is the case with a spilling breaker, all the way to shore, then that will tell you that there is no trough or deeper area running parallel to the backside or shore side of the bar. But if the crested waves rolling off the bar reform with no crest, roll into shore, and then break near shore, then that would indicate that there is a trough present. Troughs are an important structure to recognize because of how predatory fish relate to them. A hole is another piece of structure you should learn to identify. Where a trough is a deeper bottom contour that runs parallel to the beach, a hole is a deeper area that runs roughly perpendicular to the beach. They are identified by waves breaking further out on either side of the hole, while the waves traveling over the hole break near shore, sometimes as a plunging breaker. Holes can also be accompanied by a riptide, which is a kind of soft structure where water current runs out from the beach. Points and submerged points are another type of hard structure that can be identified by how waves break over them or around them. On some types of shorelines, points can be located on either sides of holes, and there can even be an alternating series of points and holes running along a beach. Sometimes points can get bent around at their offshore end and form coves. Sometimes there are just a series of little points along the beach. Regardless, they can all be identified by wave action or the soft structure water movement they create like eddies. So understanding what a wave is and how it interacts with bottom contour, as well as soft structure like current, is vital in learning how to read a beach. Once you understand what the water is telling you, you will then be able to identify key types of structure, meaning the types of areas your target fish species inhabits and feeds in. The most expensive rods and reels, the hot new plug, or the freshest bait mean nothing if you can't place them in an area that holds fish. So fishing success is built off of your understanding of wave action and your ability to read a beach. Well that's it for now. Fishing is a lifelong learning process that never ends, so I hope you find this information useful. As I mentioned earlier, I will be covering each type of beach structure in detail in future videos, so stay tuned. My version of life is that catching fish is fun, but catching fish from spots you figure out on your own is twice the fun. That's my view from the beach, so until next time, be well and catch them up.